Hi everyone, I'm Bob Birch, Web Technology Specialist with NDSU Ag Communication, and this is the recording of the first um, webinar, uh, regular webinar, uh, presented as part of Agriculture Communications' new uh, webinar series, and our, our topic today is Skype for Business. Um, this is a presentation that uh, I prepared with Becky Koch, and we delivered live together on uh, January 20th, um, and this is just a re-recording of that session, and I uh, hope that uh, you get a lot out of it. If you have questions about anything that's shared uh, in this webinar, uh, please uh, let us know. Um, you can find both uh, Becky and my uh, contact information uh, on the AgCom website. That's www.ag.ndsu.edu slash agcom. So let's start uh, talking about um, Skype for Business here. Um, originally, here at NDSU, we had a product called Link, um, and that was our product that we used for instant messaging, could also be used for audio and, and video calls. And uh, Microsoft eventually renamed that tool or sort of remade that tool, um, and Link became Skype for Business. Um, important distinction though, uh, Skype, which Microsoft owns and that you can use, you know, personally or on your own or even in a business uh, setting is a different program uh, than Skype for Business. They don't talk to each other. You can't share contacts between them. In fact, sometimes it's been a little bit of a challenge uh, for me to contact someone who has a Skype account through Skype for Business. Um, and so we've, we've run into that challenge before. So you should definitely see those as, as separate programs because they are separate programs and services, Skype for Business as opposed uh, to Skype. Now Skype for Business should be on your uh, NDSU uh, computer. It's become uh, sort of standard when uh, we set up your computers uh, here in uh, Ag Communication Computer Services to install all Skype for Business uh, right away then. Um, if your computer was not set up by AgComs Computer Services, then it might not be installed, and we'll talk a little bit about how you can go about installing that. But you should know that, that Skype for Business is approved and supported by NDSU. It's part of our Microsoft package, and it's a, it's a communication tool that, that can help you uh, do a lot of things. Keep track of your colleagues and contacts availability. Send, like I said earlier about links, send instant messages, start uh, audio and video calls, uh, and really web meetings or web conferences as well. So here's a look at what the Skype for Business client would look like on your uh, computer. Um, when you just have it open, you're not in a call or sending anyone an instant message at this point, but you can just see um, your contacts there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but some of the things that you might notice is that um, they can be set up in groups. If you see the, the groups tab there, and I have a list there of my favorites on my uh, Skype for Business client. The other thing that I can see is sort of tell where people are. So if someone's got the green dot and check mark there, like Roger Egerberg does in this uh, slide, uh, he's available. So if I wanted to send Roger an instant message, um, I'd know he was at his desk and, and available. Um, you can see uh, down at the bottom, uh, Hillary down there has a red dot and it says she's busy. So now that would tell me maybe I shouldn't send her a message. I might send her a message, but I probably would not send her an audio or video call request because she's busy. She's got someone in her office. She's got an appointment, something like that. Um, if we look up at the top, you can see uh, when I captured this, Becky was out of the office. She had an out of office message on her set up on her Outlook. And so it tells me that right in Skype for Business. And then if we look at a couple of other people, uh, uh, President Brashani there with the little yellow dot and the and the clock hands there, that tells me that he's signed into Skype for Business uh, on his computer or on uh, a smartphone app, but he's away. He hasn't touched his computer for a while. Uh, his computer is hibernating, um, so he's in the office probably some uh, today or on this particular day, but he's not at his computer right now. So I might send him a Skype. I am. I would not try and start an audio or video call because it's telling me he's not at his, at his computer. And then the last one that I'll point out here is Deb Gebke. Uh, when I captured this, uh, Deb uh, was shown as offline. What that means is that her Skype for Business client had not been launched. Um, 
and in this case for seven days. So if you have Skype for Business turned off or if you're, you're just your computer's turned off, um, then you're going to show up as offline. And so there's some more things that we could talk about uh, there, but we'll kind of move ahead as you get a chance to, to see what you can do with, with Skype for Business. So if someone was available, um, and I wanted to contact them. As we've mentioned before, there's different ways to do that. And the main ways are instant messaging, just typing them a, a message. So it's sort of like texting back and forth. Um, instant messaging is something you might be familiar with from you know, even the early days of the internet when instant messaging uh, you know, was something that, that we was sort of more popular and did more regularly. Um, I can start a voice call with them. So this can save you on long distance charges uh, inside our NDSU uh, family anyway, where if someone, you know someone on Skype for Business, rather than picking up the phone and, and putting in your long distance call, code to call them, if you can see that they're on, you can just hit the voice call and then uh, you are having a voice conversation over the internet. And so there's no long distance charge associated with that. And then the video call as well, which obviously we can't do on the phone. Uh, you can add video to that and we'll show you some of the things that you can do in a video call or uh, a full video web conference or web meeting. There are apps associated with Skype for Business as well. Um, in the very recent uh, past, they were uh, they were called Link apps, but they recently changed the name uh, the last time that they updated them. And now that both the app for Android and iOS are called Skype for Business. Um, why would you want this? Well, if you're out of the office a lot and you really uh, like that connectivity that's provided through the client, um, you can be shown as available and send instant messages and even create audio calls and video calls uh, using the app on your smartphone. Um, the one thing that you should realize about that is that it is using data, okay? Um, unless you're connected to the Wi-Fi. So if you're out on the road um, and you're trying to connect to a Skype meeting or you wanna start a video call with somebody, just realize that's going over uh, the cell uh, phone network. And so it's gonna, uh, it's gonna count against your, your data limits or data caps uh, if you happen to have that on your uh, mobile phone plan. Uh, but both for uh, for Android and for iOS, there is a, a Skype for Business app, and you just search for those either on the App Store for iOS or Google Play for Android. So installing um, Skype for Business, if it's not installed on your computer, uh, you do that by going into your Microsoft Office 365 login. Sometimes at NDSU, we refer to that as webmail because that's how it's still referenced on the NDSU homepage. And some of you might get to your webmail or Office 365 uh, login through the NDSU homepage under online services and then, and then webmail. Um, you can get there directly by going to portal.microsoftonline dot com um, and then you log in with your NDSU email address and uh, password. So let's take a look at that. I'm already logged in uh, to my Office 365 here if I can get the right uh, screen up and um, what you'll do to, to install that is to go ahead and go to this gear uh, up here um, and as we go back to our slideshow here that gear in the top right corner gives you some some options we'll show you before um, and then once you uh, go to your office 365 settings we will see an option for software so office 365 settings we'll let that load here and then here is uh, software and you can see uh, there are some options here including Skype for Business, so you could click that and install it, and that's all there is to it. Now, I want to mention a lot of people have Skype for Business, and, and when you install it, it's going to ask you this. Um, it, it, a lot of people have it installed um, for uh, to start up when their computer starts up. That's pretty handy because if you're going to use it as a regular contact tool, um, then you're going to want it to start up right away, right? Uh, if you forget to start it, if you have to start it every time you want to do an instant message or do a, a phone call, that's kind of cumbersome. And also, if you don't start it right away, then for other people who are trying to contact you, you're going to show as offline. Um, so having it start when your computer starts up, that 
uh, really makes it work the best in terms of that contact uh, availability uh, feature. All right, so we've taken a look at how to install the, the client if you don't already have it. Another thing that you can do on your Microsoft uh, Office 365 portal is to add a photo uh, into Skype for Business. Um, if you don't add a photo in, um, you're going to show up as just a, a blue silhouette and that is what's going to appear not just in the in the uh, Skype for Business client when when you show up as a contact for somebody, but also when you're in a, a meeting, an audio call or a video call, um, your face can show up there, your picture can show up there. And that's always nice. Get you know if you're not sharing video, that picture will show up, um, and so you get a chance to see a face uh, rather than just uh, the the blue silhouette. So in order to do that, a uh, similar idea, I'm logged into my Office 365 portal. Uh, again, up here at the gear in the top right, I click uh, click that. Hold on one second, I need to get to the right screen. Here we go. Um, I click that gear up here, and then I'm gonna go to Options. Under the gear, it's Options, then up to the General tab, My Account, and then right here where you see the RB, um, I can click the little pencil here to edit my photo. And so you can see there's the photo that I have uploaded now. I could delete it and upload another one. Or if you don't have one, you just click Upload Photo, browse your computer for a photo of yourself, and go ahead and save it. And then the next time uh, you use Skype for Business, you should see that photo uh, when you're in a, an audio or video call um, and others will see it if they have you as a contact uh, inside the client. So, so finding and adding contacts uh, on the uh, Skype for Business client is, is pretty easy. Um, you can see it here in the picture if I wanted to add President Brashani as a contact in Skype for Business. Um, there's a search bar up here. All I have to do is start typing uh, the name in the uh, in the search bar. Sorry about that. Get to the right screen here. Start typing the name into the search bar, and then uh, it will pop up based on our NDSU Microsoft Active Directory. So anybody who you know, it's just it's the same directory that we use for Outlook, right? So when you start typing someone's name, they're going to pop up there. When you find them, you can right click on them. Uh, and you can see there's several things I can do with that person. I could go ahead and send them an instant message, start a video call, start an audio call, send them an email message, schedule a meeting with them. Um, but what we're looking for here is add to favorites or add to contact list. So you can add them to your favorites. That's a that's a pre-created uh, group for you. Or you could add them to one of the other groups that you can create. And you can see I've got some here for AgCom, campus staff, county extension staff, extension leadership team. You know, so just as an idea of how you might break those groups down. And that's all there is to it. Choose the group that you want to add that person to. And now they are in that group in your regular contacts. What does that mean? Well, essentially it means you don't have to come to this search screen every time you want to contact them. They're going to show up in a list right on the, the default screen of your Skype for Business client. And you can just find them and click on them. And then again, either IM them, audio call or video call that person. So let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of things. I am going to show you the Skype meeting client, even though we just looked at a, at a screenshot of it. Um, here is my live uh, Skype meeting client right now. Again, I'll mention the status. If you look up at the top at my status, you can see that uh, my status is red. There's a couple of, that means busy. There's a couple of reasons that uh, it is that way. One is I have an event on my calendar right now that says I'm busy because I'm because I'm recording this webinar uh, and the other is I'm using Skype for Business to record this webinar so I'm actually in a Skype for Business conference call right now with just by myself and so it says it's red here and it says that I am in a conference call I can always change my status if if uh, I'm showed, shown as busy because of something on my Outlook calendar and I don't I don't think I should be shown as busy or I don't want to be shown as busy uh, in uh, the Skype for Business, I can change my status. And you can see some of the selections here. Um, you know, you might want to even go one step further than busy just to make sure no one bugs you. You could set yourself as do not disturb. Um, that way nobody could IM you, audio call you, or video call you. Um, and then you can see some of the other ones here. You know, be right back. 
I'm off work right now. Those are the kinds of statuses that you can, you can set as well. Here are my groups. Here's my favorites. I'm going to, I'm going to collapse those so that you can see some of the other groups that I have here and how they show up. Here's the AgCom group. Here's the County Extension Staff group um, and people that I, that I more regularly contact in that group. Um, I didn't build my list that way. I didn't go through and say, well, should, I'm going to put all the County Extension Staff at, in NDSU Extension Service into a group. Um, it's just that when I actually do you know, uh, add someone as a contact or they add me as a contact, and then I have a group to put them in because now I know you know, they're more regular users of Skype for Business, and so it makes more sense to have them in there um, and that they might be more, more uh, likely to contact me uh, using Skype for Business and, uh, and me them. Uh, you can see the green check marks for people who are available. And then if I mouse over somebody here, let's mouse over Carol. Uh, here's where I could quickly use these icons to send an instant message start an audio call or start a video call with Carol. I can also see her contact card, which has a little bit more information about her, including email address and those kinds of things. So that's a look at the Skype for, for Business uh, client. You can play around here a little bit. Uh, some things that you might wanna look at real quickly is that all the conversations are saved. So here's a history of my conversations. The IMs have all the uh, everything that was shared in the, all the text that was shared in the instant messages, uh, audio calls and video calls are only archived if you record them. Uh, you have to choose to actually record them, but I can see when they took place. Um, if I'm trying to look back and say, I remember talking to somebody on, you know, first week of January about something, and then I see, oh, it, that was Mary Berg, you know, that we had a, we had a Skype conversation. Um, and then the other thing that you'll see here is meetings. So if you have, meetings uh, scheduled on your Outlook calendar, those will show up here as well. And if any of these were Skype meetings, I could launch that Skype meeting right from here or join that Skype meeting right from here. So that's a little intro to the Skype for Business client. Um, the next thing I wanna show you is actually what the, what the video call looks like. This is gonna be a little bit of a different kind of experience because I'm the only one in this call here since, uh, uh, this archive had to be re-recorded. Uh, our initial recording did not work, but the buttons will be the same. Now, if there are many of us in this call, uh, you would see more pictures than just me. Um, you'd see a bunch of people who are who are in here, um, and their pictures would be different sizes because of the amount that have to be shown on the screen. Um, and that kind of thing. The main buttons are down here in the in the center, very easy to find. This is your video call button, so this allows you to turn your video on or off. Uh, this is your microphone, so muting or unmuting your microphone here. And then this uh, right here is your presentation uh, option. So you've got a lot of presentation options. Right now I'm presenting my desktop. So I'm just saying everything on my desktop, show that. Uh, that allows me to switch between programs easily, show you Skype for Business, then show you uh, my web browser with the, the Microsoft portal open, then show you my PowerPoint presentation. I can flip between those easily. Um, you could also present just one program. If you just had one program open, you could say, just show them this program. And that way, anything else that you did on your screen would not show up, only that program would show up. Um, and then you can also present PowerPoint files directly. Um, and so you can designate that and it gets added into the, into the Skype for Business uh, video meeting. A few other things that we talked about, adding attachments. Uh, if you add an attachment, uh, you have a file, a PDF file or something that you want to share with everybody who's in that video call or audio call, uh, you can add that attachment and a, there'll be a, an alert that pops up for everyone saying, you know, if it was me, Bob has added an attachment, um, click here to download it. And so that's a good way to get everybody an attachment. Yes, you could send it out by email beforehand, but if it's a meeting uh, or a video call that you're not sure who's gonna join, maybe you invite a lot of people, you're not sure everybody's gonna make it, or, or um, you, it's an open invitation, whoever's interested wants to come, that's a way to get uh, a file to everybody who's actually in the meeting. Uh, you do have the ability to create shared notes. Those are created using Microsoft OneNote. Um, I don't spend a lot of time on those right now, um, but just know that that's possible. And then I'm going to click the more button here 
and touch on three other things that are available within uh, Skype for Business. One is the whiteboard. So that's a shared whiteboard where potentially everybody could uh, write on a whiteboard, draw on a whiteboard at the same time electronically. Uh, there's a polling feature if you want to create a quick poll uh, for people. And then there's a Q&A. And what Q&A does is it shuts off the chat, the conversation, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, um, and turns uh, that into a question and answer so that only people can only post questions. And then you as a presenter uh, are the only one who can answer those questions. Um, so those are the those are some of the additional present presentation capabilities. Uh, the last button here is your hang up button. Uh, you get you should know what that does pretty <laughs> if you want to leave the meeting, you click the hang up button. So I mentioned the conversation or the chat that's over here on the left, this little speech bubble, it says I am. And if I click that, that will open up. So if you're in a video meeting, an audio meeting, and you want to utilize chat um, for people to ask questions, to have side conversations and those kinds of things, that's where you would access um, that. A couple of other things to check. Um, one of the biggest points of failure in a, any web conference is audio making sure that your audio device is connected properly um, and is feeding into uh, your meeting. So a couple of things I think to really be aware of, um, and they are, they're covered on this, uh, this article that I'm gonna show you from uh, the NDSU Agriculture Communication webpage on web conferencing. So it's just www.ag.ndsu.edu slash agcom and then click on web conferencing. And uh, our computer services people, uh, Jerry Raynham, has put up a, a nice computer setup instructional here about how to uh, troubleshoot your audio. And it really starts with making sure that your computer audio is selected correctly, that the right speaker and the right microphone are selected on your uh, computer. Um, and if you have a Windows computer, you could play with that right now. Just look for the little loudspeaker kind of looking guy down in the lower right corner, right next to your, your time and date and right click on that and choose playback devices or recording devices and take a look at that and see, okay, what's selected? Is my computer audio selected? Is my computer microphone selected? If you have a laptop computer and that thing is sitting in a dock right now with the cover closed and your, com your laptop microphone is the selected audio device and you don't have another microphone hooked up, you're gonna have problems, right? You're not gonna be able to share your voice uh, in voice calls. Um, or video calls. And so making sure your external microphone, your headset or whatever is selected um, for playback or recording or both um, is important at the computer level. And then once we get to that, then we can take a look at it on the Skype for business level. And the, the screenshot that you're seeing here, it does say link options is a little bit of an old screenshot. So let me show you in Skype for business. So here I am in the Skype for business client and the little gear here always gives me options. And when I click on that, you can see I've got a area here for audio device um, and I can choose from a list of available audio devices. I'm using my external Yeti stereo microphone. And when I'm talking, I can see this blue bar moving. That tells me my microphone is working. I can play a test sound, make sure that I can hear it through whatever I've selected uh, as my audio device as well. So make sure that is set up in Skype for Business in the client. If it's set up right on your computer and it's set up in the Skype for Business client, when you get into the actual Skype for Business video meeting, you should have no problems uh, whatsoever. But you can always double check it in here by clicking this little telephone call control guy and clicking on devices and just making sure that the correct device is selected. If it's not, you can switch to the correct device and then your audio and uh, will work for you. Um, if you've done all those things and people still aren't hearing you in the meeting, uh, check that you're not muted, check that your headset doesn't have a mute button. I happen to use a headset at home that has a mute button on the, on the cord. Um, and so you, sometimes that gets pressed accidentally and people aren't hearing me because of that. So uh, narrows down the, the points of failure anyway. 
The last button that I'm going to talk about here is uh, this little ellipsis over here that gives us more options about the meeting. Uh, you can see here I could pause, stop, manage recordings. That's because I'm recording right now. If I wasn't, it would. that's where I would go to start a recording. Um, and then you also have some different meeting options uh, and the opportunity to end the meeting uh, as well. So those are sort of your main things to be concerned about when you're inside of an audio or video call uh, in Skype or Skype for Business uh, web conference. I do want to talk to you about actually starting a Skype for Business uh, web conference or video meeting uh, from Outlook. Uh, you can do that from your Outlook calendar. So um, you can see here on my Outlook calendar, if you look up at the top, uh, this is where I would create a meeting or an appointment for myself. And I also have the option to do a new Skype meeting. And so I can click that. And then there's really a couple of different things that I can do with this. Um, it's a couple of different things that I can do with this. So, you know, first thing to notice is as soon as I click that, uh, this link gets created to a Skype for business meeting. And even if I do nothing else with this, that link is still valid. So I could copy this, this link, um, and paste it into an email and say, Hey, everybody, I'm having a meeting, join me at this time. And, Everybody could click on that link in the email and you would all end up in the Skype for Business meeting, even if I never save this calendar event. So that's one thing that you can do with it. So if you're going to take that approach, another thing that you could do with it um, would be to let's just invite uh, the presenters uh, to this to this meeting in terms of whose calendar does it go on. So let's say I'm Becky and I are presenting. I'm going to add Becky here. I don't have to add myself because it's on my calendar and we'll just do we're, we're doing a webinar. And so we're the presenters. And then I'd go ahead and send this to Becky when she accepted it. It would be on her calendar. But for everybody who is going to attend the webinar, I might just send an email again with this link in it and that will allow them to join the meeting. So that's another way to to handle that. And then the third way is to say, well, I'm just going to invite everybody, right? So you could use a listserv, uh, you could use, you know, a group of, uh, of contacts that you have created, or you could just type everybody's name in who's part of the meeting. And that way, everybody uh, in that list would be asked, you know, this is a calendar event. Do you want to accept it? Uh, or decline it and if they accept it be added to their calendar and that link in here uh, would would stay in there of course as long as you don't edit it out and that would be the way that they join the meeting at the time uh, that you've designated that that meeting for and of course you can add more content to this if you want to uh, one of the other things I'll mention here is that you there are some meeting options that you can control uh, from this screen when you're creating a Skype meeting. And if you click this meeting options button, uh, a few things I'll mention here. One is there is a lobby. I haven't used it much, um, but the idea is if you want people to be able to join the meeting but not actually see the, the actual meeting until the designated time, you could have them wait in a lobby and then let them in uh, when you're ready uh, for them. Uh, the other thing is who's a presenter when they come into the meeting and you should note that the default for this when you create a Skype meeting, a Skype for business meeting in Outlook is anyone from my organization. So anyone from NDSU uh, with an NDSU.edu email address who comes into this meeting will be a presenter. What does that mean? That means they can click most all the same buttons that you can click. So they could click the presentation button and share their desktop. Um, or launch a whiteboard or create a poll or any of the things that that you can do as a presenter if you don't want that um, you can change that to either make it looser you know and say anyone can be a presenter um, or make it tighter and say only people I choose can be a presenter if you do that you have to uh, choose people who you have invited to this event so you see Becky is the only one that's in the attendees list here because she's the only one I've put up here uh, and invited in the meeting. If I put someone else up there, let me cancel these two things real quickly and I'll put, I'll put Sonia up there as well. If I put someone else up there and then go to the meeting options and people I choose, choose presenters, now you see Becky and Sonia are in there and if I want one of them to be a presenter when they come in the room I just add them over here now when the meeting starts when Becky comes in she's already a presenter um, but Sonia is just an attendee so th they have different levels of rights and then the last uh, item here 
option in who's a presenter is you can say only me. So just me, don't let anyone else be a presenter. Um, and and uh, that way you can kind of keep control of that. A few other options here, disable instant messaging. That'll get rid of the conversation pane. That's up to you if you want to do that. Mute all attendees. This can be helpful if you have a lot of people coming into the room. This will mute them when they first come into the room so that you don't end up with a bunch of people with their mics open. Some of them maybe are in noisy rooms. Maybe somebody has feedback happening on their microphone. Um, so that way you, you can manage that a little bit. And then also you can block attendees video if you don't want people sharing video because of what you might possibly see that you don't want to see um, or uh, just to save bandwidth, right? If there's 50 people in the meeting and they're all sharing video, it's using up a lot of bandwidth uh, in terms of the network and it might cause performance problems. So those are some of the things that you can do when you create a Skype for Business meeting from within Outlook. So let's, let's move on from that. We're not going to save any of the changes here and come back to the presentation. And and we're just, I'm just going to give you a few tips about you know how to have a successful web conference. And these these aren't Skype for Business specific. They apply to anything. If you're having web meetings on Google Hangouts or on on another university's Adobe Connect system or something like that or, or Zoom, um, then you you know these tips should help you out. One of the things I like to recommend is using a USB headset. Some of us still have hanging around the old headsets with those two little uh mini plugs on them you know make one for the microphone one for the headset um the fact is they just don't put out as much uh power as the usb headset and in some systems you can find that hey you know um even though i've got my my mic level turned all the way up on my computer and all the way up in the system people are still having trouble hearing me just because my headset does not put out enough power and a USB headset puts out more power. The other thing a USB headset helps you do is not uh, have audio problems because you accidentally plug the mic into the headphone and the headphone into the mic jack. So that can be confusing with the two plugs. USB, you've just got the one plug um, and you're ready to go. And I also think not only do, do the USB headphones put out a higher signal, but I think they're, they have a better sound. They're cleaner, less, less noise, background noise and, and buzzing and those kinds of things. So USB headsets, very reasonably uh, priced. Um, I just pulled a couple off of Amazon a while back and um, you can see there's, there's one for 36 bucks, but you can find them cheaper than that. Um, they go all the way up to the, the Triton, uh, Dolby one there for 208 bucks. You probably don't need that, um, you know, unless you're you're doing broadcast quality. Or you can see here that that particular one is may, meant for gaming, so the the sound in the headset has surround sound, noise canceling, some of those kinds of things that um, uh, are are higher tech. So you probably don't need to go that far. Um, but you can find a pair easily in a price range that works for you and 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 uh, a form factor that works for you as well. Video. So again, I mentioned, you know, if you have a laptop and it's a dock, it's in a dock, um, that video camera that's, you know, at the top of your screen is not doing you any good because your, uh, your cover is closed. So having an external video camera can be very helpful. I have a few of them hanging around. I've got, I've got one that's in my bag. So if I'm, I'm on the road, uh, and I want to use it, I can, I can do that. I've got one that's sitting at my home office, uh, and then I've also got one, of course, here because mostly because my laptop is is on a dock. Um, you can get them very reasonably. You can see that that Microsoft Life Cam one there for ten bucks. Um, that probably work absolutely fine in terms of an external uh, video camera. Um, but if you want to be doing a lot of presenting where you're sharing your video, uh, and especially if you're presenting for the public, then you might think about getting an HD webcam. Uh, the one I see that you see there, the Logitech one, is 65 bucks. Um, that's around uh, a good price range for an HD uh, webcam. I like Logitech a lot. Don't take it as an endorsement, but I do use a lot of Logitech uh, external uh, peripheral items like headsets and and uh, video uh, webcams. So that might be something to think about. Um, I do want to stress, you know, the the camera on your laptop, uh, you know, especially with our uh, replacement cycle on our laptops here at NDSU Extension Service. Um, it's probably a pretty good camera. I'm not saying it's a bad camera. I'm just saying with that docking issue, 
um, you have your cover closed, uh, having an external webcam in your office uh, could be a good thing. So I mentioned the audio setup before, um, but I'm just gonna, I, I wanna touch on it again. If you make, if you know how to set your audio device in your, on your computer and you know how to set it inside the program that you're using, you really shouldn't run into very many audio problems where you can't hear the speaker or the speaker can't hear you. So just be familiar with that. On the left, you'll see that that's the pop-up box that I talked about before with the little uh, loudspeaker down in the lower right corner of your, of your system tray next to the time and date. If you right click that and go to either playback or recording, you're gonna see this screen. You can see playback and recording are tabs that are available on there. And you just say, I wanna hear my sound through this device and set it as the default. And I wanna record my voice through this device and set that as the default. And that will set it up on your computer. Then open up your the program that you're gonna be using, whether that's Skype for Business or something else. And, and again, that those audio and video settings can be available there. Uh, as well. And as long as all of those are set, you really should not run into to very many problems. So just in general, if you're going to be on a web meeting, especially if you're presenting, you know, uh, control your audio. Uh, turn off your phone, close your door. If you don't have a door, find a quiet place. Um, that's a picture of my door with a, a little on-air sign that I have um, that keeps people from knocking on my door, especially when I'm recording or presenting something. Other thing that I'll do is, um, you know, make sure that my desk phone uh, is either the ringer is turned down or just unplug it from the wall um, so that it doesn't ring, especially when I'm presenting and or uh, recording a webinar. Um, but even if you're not, if you're just attending, um, Right. If you're in a face to face uh, situation, um, you would not have all these interruptions. So even if you're just trying to learn something, it's great to you know, cut down on the interruptions, cut down on the distractions um, when you're attending a web meeting or webinar as well. Muting your microphone when you're not speaking. So this is really more for attendees. Um, when you're in a meeting and you're not speaking, mute your microphone. Um, sometimes you have no idea what's going out over your microphone. Okay, so that was an interesting do as I say and not as I do moment because you might have heard my phone ring there uh, real quickly um, after I just told you, you know, make sure that your phone's turned off and muted and those kinds of things. So I um, apologize for that. Um, but back to this idea of muting your microphone when you're not speaking, uh, you, you really don't know what's uh, going over your microphone. It might be noisy. It might not seem noisy to you in your, in your room, but it, there might be some noise that's interfering with people hearing in the speaker or hearing each other. Um, more common would be feedback. So sometimes there's just something wrong in your setup um, that might be causing some feedback. Maybe a slow internet connection can also so can also cause some humming or some feedback. If you're leaving your microphone open, that's everyone else is hearing that and you're not hearing it because typically in a web conferencing situation, you don't hear your own audio. So you have no idea it's happening. So if you just mute your microphone when you're not speaking, uh, that is you know just considered courteous. Uh, to the other people in a web conference or, an, or an online meeting. If you are sharing video, avoiding ba backlight is important. You can see here those windows uh, behind uh, this person uh, cause them to look like a silhouette and you can't even see uh, the person's face. So, you know, if they if you're not actually seeing someone's face and expressions, then there's no point in sharing video anyway. So if you're going to share video, uh, pay attention to that lighting. Um, one of the things that I did early, early on on the recommendation of, of Bruce Sundin was to get a front light. And all that means is, you know, I went to Walmart and bought a $5 desk lamp um, and I, it's up between my two computer screens in front of me. And I just flip that on whenever I'm on a video meeting or online call. And that provides some light on my face. So even if I have a window or fluorescent light in the background, um, it balances that out and you can actually uh, see my face. Sometimes you can take that overboard. It's always a balance. You don't want so much light on your face that you look like a ghost either. But um, but being seen is the point of sharing the video. So make sure that that uh, people can see you. Clearing the background of of clutter and other distractions. Um, again, just you know, 
be attention pay attention to what's on your your screen when you're sharing video if you've got a messy office or if you see on the inset there uh, if you're wearing something that um, does not uh, cover your your body in a way um, it, it might be just fine uh, to you know if we saw all of this person um, you know it's probably just a, a warm summer day and and may have some kind of some kind of outfit on that that uh, doesn't go above um, her shoulders but when she's cut off on the torso there, it looks like she has nothing on at all. And that can be distracting and off-putting potentially uh, for people. So just, it's just, that's an extreme example. Obviously, it's probably not going to come up for a lot of us very often. But just being aware of what you look like in the video and trying to make that as professional looking as possible uh, is, is really recommended. Placing your camera at eye level and actually looking at the camera when you talk to people, this is a challenge. Um, it, it's a challenge for me. I have two screens, so I might have something on a screen to my right. My web camera is mounted on a screen to my left, and I look at, look, you know, I'm looking at something on the screen to my right, and now all of a sudden, uh, you're just seeing the side of my face. Um, you know, that's that's to be expected, especially if this is a working meeting. Um, you know, that, that definitely happens, but when I'm talking, like, especially when I'm directly addressing the people on the meeting, I like to look at the camera. And so having my camera at eye level, just like looking someone in the eye, when you're talking to them face to face, that's what you want to, you want to shoot for. So again, I just want to, I hope this was a good sort of introduction to Skype for business covered a lot of things. Um, I appreciate your time and your patience uh, with this. But if you have questions, uh, go to the AgCom page, www.ag.ndsu.edu slash AgCom, A-G-C-O-M-M. -M. Uh, look for the web conferencing link. Uh, also look for our directory. Uh, there you can find how to contact me or Becky Koch or Sonia Fox uh, or uh, Jerry Ranham and John Fry and Blair Johnson. All of us can help you. Uh, with uh, Skype for Business. So please uh, don't hesitate to contact us with your questions. All right. Thanks, everybody. A reminder that the next AgCom webinar is February 18th at 3 p.m. Central Time. We'll be talking about OneDrive, Google Drive, SharePoint, some of the collaboration and storage options that are available here at NDSU. Thanks.